Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India One of the greatest Mughal builders was the Emperor Shah Jahan who is credited with building the Taj but it was not just the Taj Mahal that he patronized he also built for himself a brand new city in Delhi that he called Shah Jahanabad the citadel of Shah Jahanabad is called the Red Fort and it has become an emblem of the Republic of India now but early in his career Shah Jahan when he was a mere governor of Sindh is credited with building this mosque this mosque which he patronized is unlike anything else that the Mughals are building this is because in Sindh in Thatta people are looking westward for architectural insp inspiration this mosque is closer in both its craftsmanship and its style and its planning logic to buildings that you will find on the Iranian plateau but the city of Shah Jahanabad which is built in Delhi just north of the Purana Kila becomes a hallmark of what would be called the Shah Jahan style and which would be known as the Mughal style all over India soon after the city of old Delhi with its numerous gates is what Shah Jahan built names like Kashmir gate Ajmer gate Lahore gate are all gates of this city to the eastern edge of this city along the banks of the Yamuna river was a palace a fortified citadel that he built for himself this would eventually be called the red fort the red fort is where india historically declared independence in 1947 and thus it became inextricably tied up with an image of new india as you enter the red fort you come across a bazaar called the chatta bazaar which is a kind of covered bazaar that you find in many mughal cities alcoves on both sides provide space for shopkeepers whereas the main area through which the customers process is completely covered this is not unlike the big bazaars you have in iran inside the red fort are a whole series of pavilions that shah jahan built this one called the diwan e aam or the hall of public audience is one where as we saw a whole series of barriers in terms of uh, railings in terms of ropes in terms of heights of various platforms would separate the commonest of people from the emperor shah jahan favors a number of new elements in his building programs the most famous of which is the cusp arch and the baluster column the multifoil arch with scallops is something shah jahan uses in almost all his buildings as is the baluster column and we will look at drawings of both these later inside you have a platform the mughal emperor did not sit on a throne which was like a seat but really a throne which was a platform called the takht above this platform you see a curvilinear roof this would be the characteristic bangla roof that mughal buildings get associated with again to be examined in a set of drawings later a much smaller building much like the diwan e aam is the diwan e khas or the hall of private audience which would be open only to a select few who would be entertained in an audience with the emperor inside this building is a lot more lavishly decorated with some techniques of stone inlay that come in from italy particularly from florence in the reign of shah jahan this technique called pietra dura or stone inlay is masterfully worked by artisans of agra and then later also in rajasthan so much so that it is impossible to imagine these regions without this tradition but we do know again from the scholar eba cock that these traditions really come from europe in the 17th century what we also forget is that these buildings were completely covered with tent like awnings with rugs with curtains with all kinds of material that made the building living so now when we look at an empty building it really is looking like a naked person inside there is rich carved marble in the chambers that are known as the chambers of residence or the khas mahal you have pools of water that flow through various chambers 
sleeping chambers and living quarters, the water would have made the hot summers of Delhi tolerable. Being on the banks of the Yamuna, having a hydraulic system through which fresh water was continuously channeled was not a big challenge. The decoration on these walls resembles what is called a chini khana or a set of niches that were used to display porcelain, particularly from China. The Chinese blue and white wares that are ubiquitously found across India were also found at the Mughal court. They were displayed in niches on walls and in some of the later buildings, the niches disappear and are replaced with decorative motifs on the walls themselves like you see here. Here is a painting of the Prince Shah Jahan being received by Jahangir after campaigning in Ajmer. Notice that you see elements of Mughal decoration like the Chini Khana on the walls behind the emperor. You also see in pictures like this a lot of the elements that are completely missing from the buildings now. Here are some details of the Pietra Dura technique used by the Mughals. Note that all the inlaid stone inlaid into marble is actually semi-precious. They are not using cheap stones but quite expensive materials on entire surfaces of buildings. Not surprising because it is in this period that the GDP of India is a quarter of the GDP of the whole world. The Mughal emperor is one of the richest people on earth and the empire is one of the most prosperous. So what people can afford to have only in small decorative objects in Europe can be done on the scale of buildings in India for decoration. Inside the red fort is another small mosque called the Moti Masjid, most probably named on account of the small pearl like domes it has. A private royal mosque meant only for the emperor's worship. The Moti Masjid also became a model for several mosques in the Mughal domains and we shall see one of these mosques at Aurangabad built under Aurangzeb a few minutes later. The whole ensemble of the red fort the Jama Masjid from whose tower we are looking at the red fort over here. The city walls made for an impressive spectacle and visitors have left behind several accounts of how grand this city of Shah Jahanabad was. The Jama Masjid which is completely surrounded by urban squalor now stood alone very proudly with a large gateway on top of a large flight of stairs much like the Bulan Darwaza at Fatehpur Sikri as this picture from the 19th century shows. The Jami Mosque is one of the largest mosques in India and still holds an active congregation. The big courtyard can host thousands of people. The most impressive building that Shah Jahan patronizes is a mausoleum in the memory of his wife that he builds in the city of Agra. Known as the Taj Mahal, the whole complex is entered through a gateway which itself would be a monument had it not been overshadowed by the building that is inside. Again, notice the whole string of chhatris, the monumental Ivan doorway that the Mughals get from the Timurids and also the largely biaxial symmetry which is to say that four facades of the building are more or less the same. Inside upon entering, you see a building that has been described as one of the most beautiful buildings on earth. It is considered to be a wonder of the world. But this building does not stand in isolation. It actually is in the same lineage of buildings that we have starting from Humayun's tomb and which will later end with Safdarjang's tomb in Delhi. This building is not built in marble but is clad in marble because marble is not a good building material. The building is built in brick, the marble is only attached on as revetment. This building is also unusual because it does not sit in the middle of a Mughal garden but at the end of it on the banks of the Yamuna river. On either side of this marble building on the high platform are these red buildings one of which is called a Musafir Khana or a guest house 
and the other one of which is a mosque. The mosque and the guest house do not have to look different from each other because there is no prescription that says a mosque or a guest house have to look a certain way. The mosque certainly has to indicate the direction of Mecca which is towards the west when you are in the Indian subcontinent. The Taj like Humayun's tomb, like Akbar's tomb and like many other Mughal monuments sits on a very high platform and already there is a sense of hierarchy when you are allowed onto that platform and there is a sense of leaving the more mundane and pedestrian world behind. Shah Jahan also builds a number of buildings in the Red Fort at Agra, not the Delhi Red Fort but the Agra one. He builds for himself a whole set of pavilions and the pavilions on either side which have those curvilinear roofs called the Bangla roofs are attributed to his two daughters, Aurangzeb's sisters. Clearly Shah Jahan, unlike his predecessors, uses marble everywhere he can. Almost all decoration in his palaces is in marble. Whereas with Akbar, we had the use of sandstone and the use of marble sparingly for effect. With Shah Jahan, it is all marble. Sandstone has taken a back seat. In this pavilion in the Agra fort, you can clearly see the niches that comprise the Chini Khana. These are niches in which various kinds of porcelain objects would have been displayed. Again, long colonnades with these fluted columns, the multifoil arches, all hallmarks of Shah Jahan's architectural patronage can be seen in the Agra fort. And the pavilions with these curvilinear roofs, the Bangla roofs that I keep talking of, find full expression under Shah Jahan. We shall talk about where this particular form comes from and how it is picked up by the Mughals and how it gets exported all across India. In the city of Lahore, while not quite in India, but certainly a part of undivided India before 1947, we have a similar kind of fort which is expanded by Shah Jahan's son Aurangzeb. While you see the fort in the background, what you see is a white gateway added by Aurangzeb, a small Mughal garden in front of it, and towards us, a big mosque called the Badshahi Mosque that Aurangzeb builds. But inside Lahore Fort is another pavilion built by Shah Jahan. And it is this pavilion that interests us because this curvilinear roof has been put center stage now. Shah Jahan still favors very intricate marble screens for his decoration and his pavilion at the back overlooks a set of gardens through these marble screens. And it is exactly this kind of finesse that is lost when his son comes to power. His son faces a lot of political uncertainty, has a very suspicious temperament, is a very zealous and orthodox religious figure and decides to disband painting ateliers because he has no time for the arts, choosing instead to build one set of buildings, mosques largely mosques. Aurangzeb's reign will thus be known as we saw in the Lahore fort. This is the gateway he builds, not a military gateway but a ceremonial gateway to get to the mosque that is beyond. The Badshahi mosque he builds in Lahore is one of the largest. Again following the same prescribed pattern of mosques, almost the same as the one built by Akbar at Fatehpur Sikri except for the big bulbous domes behind. Aurangzeb makes great strides in conquering kingdoms of the Deccan such as Bijapur and in all these places like Bijapur that you see here where you already have an existing Jami mosque he expands it. So he expands the mosque in Bijapur, he expands a Qutub Shahi mosque called the Makkah Masjid in Hyderabad or Golconda, he expands the Jami Masjid in Aurangabad. The question is does he build any palaces and he does particularly in Aurangabad and even when he doesn't, his nobles do. A nobleman of his from Rajasthan called Pahar Singh builds himself this palace called the Soneri Mahal which is now a state archaeology department museum in the city of Aurangabad. Situated on the campus of Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar Maratwada University, this particular building 
is exemplary of Mughal palaces. It sits in a large walled enclosure with these water channels. You have cascades of water coming down. The building is symmetrical and the landscape is very important to its sustenance. It is no coincidence that the hillock at the back frames the building almost to suggest that the water is flowing down from the hill. Aurangzeb similarly will build himself this palace called the Kilai Ark in Aurangabad when he is serving as governor of the Deccan as a prince. This building does not survive in this shape anymore. This is a picture that was taken early in the 20th century. If you look, this is where the palace stands. There was a big processional way going straight down with a number of city gates in these places. The building that you see here used to be a maidan called the Am Khas Maidan, suggesting that this was the area that separated the common people from the royal enclosure. A fantastic mosque called Shah Alamgir's Masjid is over here and it is a royal mosque modeled along the Moti Masjid in the Red Fort in Delhi. Behind is a huge garden called Himayat Bagh which still exists to some degree today. The palaces of Aurangzeb are in very bad shape. This is what they look like now. Completely plastered over, they have been redone and served as a college in the 70s and 80s till they were completely abandoned. But going inside, you start seeing traces of Mughal splendor such as these alcoves and the Chini Khana. Looking closely at the walls from the inside, you see the elements of Mughal architecture like the multi-foil arches and the cypress columns or the baluster columns. Mapping this palace, what you see is a layout of three stories in terraces with vistas controlling the waterway on one side and gardens at the back. This is Alamgir's mosque, the small royal mosque in this complex which looks a bit like the Moti mosque or Moti masjid in its proportions. The only other notable thing that is attributed to Aurangzeb in the Deccan is a place where he died close to Ahmadnagar. He had been camping at this place for years and it was a very simple military camp with a small enclosure wall on the outside, a mosque and a baradari on the inside and a gatehouse that controlled access to it. Later when Aurangzeb dies, a small funerary platform was built in the center where his body was embalmed before it was sent to its final resting place in Khuldabad. This is that funerary platform that was constructed after his death. But it is this Baradari which is of interest to us because it displays another feature of Mughal architecture, the Jharoka, which is very important in the political life of the empire. At Bhingar is where Aurangzeb spent the last few years of his life organizing his troops reviewing his troops and making small campaigns outside. Those three arched openings on top provide the jaroka, the small window-like opening through which the populace, notably a select populace, would see the emperor appear regularly and therefore know that he was well and alive. In a court which was full of intrigues and conspiracies, it was very important for the living emperor to be seen by people to dispel all kinds of rumors about him. A lot of Mughal paintings also display this feature of the Jaroka and here is a painting of Aurangzeb appearing to his troops in the morning. This is what this Jaroka looks like from the inside of the building, a small place where the emperor would appear to his troops who were stationed outside the wall. Note the roofs on top are the curvilinear Bangla roofs. This is what the Baradari looks like. The staircase is within the wall which is also part of the enclosure wall of the royal camp. So when the emperor goes up the stairs 
and sits above those stairs in that jaroka. He is sitting at the very edge of the royal camp with his troops on the outside. Now the Mughals also had a whole string of cousins, the Rajputs, who were their first and second cousins from the time of Akbar and Jodha onwards. And a lot of these Rajput princes grew up at the Mughal court. Similarly, a lot of the Mughal princes were sent to the Rajput courts. And thus, the visual vocabulary of the Mughals and the Rajputs was the same imperial architectural vocabulary. The fort of Amer, which is the fort outside of Jaipur, is one such extant set of buildings that shows the connections between the Rajputs and the Mughals. Set high on a hill, it is impregnable and is distant from the city of Jaipur, which was founded later. Upon entering, one sees a number of shapes that are now familiar. We have seen these in the pavilion at Lahore Fort, in pavilions at the, at the fort in Agra. These longitudinal vaulted spaces with eaves that come down sharply, things that we have been calling Bangla roofs. You also look at the arches which are multifoil, the columns which are shaped like balusters and you know this is a Mughal architectural vocabulary. As you go up the palace, you start seeing formations that look exactly like Mughal formations except the decoration is of a slightly different order. A big central portal through which you enter flanked by double story towers, on top a set of vaulted roofs, roof lines full of chhatris, structural details that look like Timurid details except they are painted on and here you see a lot more uh, idolatrous decoration because the Rajputs were Hindus, but symmetrical gardens with parterre arrangements, central fountains, quadripartite planning. These kinds of gardens that we associate with the Mughals are also seen in Rajput palaces everywhere. In fact, once you are up on Amir Fort and you look down at the gardens at the base, this is what they look like. They look like Islamic geometric patterns. The same fashion of having ceramic, glass and mirror lined rooms and palaces continues with the Rajput princes who also build themselves fancy pavilions just like that. Here are more details of the rich decoration and what you see in mirror and glass here is the same idea of a chini khana that we saw. The naturalistic decoration, stylized flowers, observations from nature, all of which were part of Jahangir's palette of carving, decoration and painting are to be seen at Amer. In fact, palaces around Jaipur also bear a Mughal imprint. In facade, this is not very different from something like the tomb of Itimadud Daula that we saw at Agra. Perhaps the most iconic of buildings in Jaipur, built much later, is the Hava Mahal. But if you consider the Hava Mahal an assemblage of discrete architectural elements, each one of those elements can be traced back to a Mughal lineage, whether it's the curvilinear roofs, whether it's the profusion of kiosks, whether it is the jarokas, everything that you find in emperors from Jahangir to Aurangzeb. And here we will end the Mughals with a small close up of what we have been describing as a set of wall niches to display curios from across the world that the Mughals are trading with. Thank you.